the last panel of the day. This time it is about closing the carbon cycle not with, with biomass. And you, you may see that in at least some of the examples that even that might involve industrial capture of carbon dioxide. Uh, Frank O'Keefe, who is interested in this space and I have known for many years, uh, will moderate the panel. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Excuse me for reciting a few numbers that you all know, but uh, in order to frame the conversation, I'll do so. Uh, in 1990, as a planet, we emitted 20 billion tons of CO2. In 2013, uh, we emitted 32 billion tons. Uh, carbon dioxide content is increasing by 2.5 ppm per year. If population continues to rise at 1% a year, then uh, we'll be at 5 ppm in 15 years. Uh, as Roger Revelle uh, said most memorably, that we are engaged in man's greatest geophysical experiment. Uh, as was noted earlier today, we spend billions at the Department of Defense uh, to either ward off or to succeed at war. We spend tens of millions at the NIH to combat pandemics. Uh, yet, we effectively spend nothing on air capture. Uh, the panelists joined here with me and, uh, and clearly everybody in the room is dedicating, dedicated to avoiding climate crisis. Uh, Rob Martinson to my left and, uh, and Mr. Gupta to my far left have been focused on biofuels, uh, duckweed, algae, and other ways uh, to utilize plants to solve some of our problems uh, as regards CO2. Uh, Rob has also been focused on preservation of a, a CO2 sink, uh, rainforests, by his work, and he'll talk about it, uh, his work in oil palm trees. Uh, Tim Kruger uh, has been focused on creation, or I should say augmentation, of seawater uh, as a carbon sink, and he, he may talk a bit about that, but he's also uh, terribly concerned about water use and cultivation, uh, which of course uh, water is in scarce supply. Uh, Infinitry is a company that will use uh, Klaus Lackner's CO2 capture technology uh, to enhance greenhouse environments to uh, increase biomass production and uh, grow more food, and perhaps uh, grow biofuels. Uh, we will do so with a lot less water than we would otherwise use without use of fertilizer and uh, or with a lot less fertilizer, X the CO2 that we'll be enriching the environment with and without pesticides. Uh, by learning, uh, by putting to work uh, Klaus's technology in greenhouses, we will learn a great deal about its prospects, uh, perhaps its shortcomings, and how we can improve it. Uh, that's important because as methane bubbles through Arctic lakes and through Arctic ice water, uh, there is uh, some uh, fear that we'll have to know what to do soon. Uh, we know that we can capture a ton a day uh, with, and I'll excuse me, Klaus, for continually calling this the Lackner unit, but that's what it is. Uh, we can capture a ton a day with the Lackner unit. Um, therefore, it would take 100 million of these units to counter the 32 billion tons of CO2 that we're emitting today. Uh, as a point of reference, uh, we manufacture on the planet 80 million cars a year. Uh, so while it may seem like a moonshot, uh, it really isn't. Uh, once we, uh, we retooled an entire city to mobilize in 1941, and uh, what we hope to do 
uh, with our effort at Infinitry is to learn what succeeds. So should it come to it, we'll know what to make, what to build to capture carbon quickly. Uh, so we will enable plants to consume our waste uh, and speed biomass production as a result. Uh, we're going to talk today, or, or Tim and Dr. Gupta are going to talk a bit about biomass uh, uh, production as regards uh, uh, biofuels. Uh, what we know, and this was focused on earlier today, that the government, the United States government, has put 36 billion uh, gallons of biofuel production as a goal. And uh, they also put a cap on how much of that can be derived from corn. Well, we've reached that cap. So today we may learn a bit about uh, other sources. Uh, meanwhile, we're, we're poised to welcome another two billion people, another two billion souls to the planet uh, without the, the arable land to feed them and uh, candidly without the water uh, to quench their thirst. Uh, so as I turn over the, the mic to Rob, I want to say something positive. And it's this. Uh, two decades ago, there, there wasn't a greenhouse in China. Uh, today, they have uh, uh, 330 times the area under greenhouse cultivation that we have here in the United States. Uh, we think that what's happened in China in the past 20 years is likely predictive for what will happen in other countries as we face fuel, uh, food insecurity. And I'd like to say one more thing that's at least somewhat positive. I was with, or I witnessed a speech a week and a half ago by Paul Pullman, who you may know as CEO of Unilever. And he said something that really struck me, and it was this. It is too late to be a pessimist. So I hand it over to Rob Martinson of Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Uh, well, well, um, thanks for that uh, introduction. And thanks so much for the invitation, Frank and Klaus. I don't normally uh, come to uh, workshops of this sort, but of course, as a plant biologist, plant geneticist, uh, we are in fact working on the oldest air capture system on Earth. Um, and I'm going to try to persuade you that aquatic plants play a very important role in that system uh, and are, are potentially a wonderful source of, uh, of biofuels uh, and indeed have played a role in our distant past. Um, uh, Lemnaceae uh, duckweeds are actually uh, small flowering plants. They're some of the fastest growing flowering plants on earth. Uh, they uh, grow clonally, that's to say they just bud from leaf to leaf or from frond to frond. I'll show you a tiny bit of botany uh, later on. And this is what gives them their, their extraordinary growth rates. Uh, but right now, they're not being used as biofuels. Uh, most of the existing energy crops, uh, as, you, as you well know, uh, are consistent in this country, for example, of, of corn. Uh, in Brazil, uh, sugarcane is an enormous uh, biofuel crop. And, and in this country, again, switchgrass is being thought of as an as, as interesting energy crop. But they have all sorts of problems. Uh, they still require high energy inputs. Some of them, many of them, most of them compete with the food supply. Uh, and, uh, and they have all sorts of byproducts like lignin, which are actually a, a big problem in, the, in processing. So algae have been pro promoted as an alternative. They have a lot of advantages. They can make oil, for example, uh, which is uh, directly, which in fact is where a lot of our current fossil fuels come from, is ancient uh, uh, plants and animals, phyto and, uh, um, and zooplankton. Uh, and, uh, and, and they have all sorts of harvest issues uh, as well. And so we think that, uh, uh, that in fact uh, duckweed uh, has some potential. However, it hasn't really been measured as, an, as a, a biofuel yet, uh, and I took these numbers from the World Watch Institute. Uh, this is what we call fossil energy balance in the biofuels uh, uh, community, which means how much energy to get out for every unit of energy that you put in. Uh, and uh, as you see from this, uh, corn bioethanol, this is actually a very optimistic view. Uh, some people think it's less than one, which means of course it's essentially useless. Uh, uh, whereas uh, some of the other um, uh, potential biofuels are actually very, very, have very good energy balance. For example, sugarcane, which is in widespread use, has, has an, uh, an enormously positive energy balance. Uh, in terms of oils, uh, palm oil actually represents the, the best so far in terms of uh, energy balance, but of course palm oil uh, comes with another problem, uh, which is that although it's the most uh, productive oil crop in the world, 
Uh, and, and, and this is, by the way, a photograph taken by a colleague of mine in Malaysia from a helicopter in, in Borneo, uh, showing a native rainforest on the left and a palm oil plantation on the right. And you can see that competition is pretty intense. Furthermore, palm oil uh, accounts for something like 50% of the edible oil consumed uh, on, on the planet. And so it is an enormously important source of food as well. So the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, uh, which we've been collaborating with, has uh, 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 proposed uh, that there should be no further rainforest uh, deforestation in Malaysia. Uh, this was actually announced in the 1990s. And that therefore, they were going to take other approaches to increasing yield. And uh, so it's been my pleasure to collaborate uh, with a number of groups, uh, including the, the very importantly MPOB, also a, a small startup company. For, it's a spin off of my institution, Cold Spring Harbor Lab, as well as some colleagues at the American Museum of Natural History. And we were able uh, last year to identify a gene, a single gene. Uh, using plant genetics in the oil palm uh, genome, uh, which is able to increase yields by 30% very predictably in hybrid seed. And we were able to develop a test for this gene that would enable even smallholders to very cheaply identify seeds that, when planted, would produce yields for 20 years that were 30% better than normal. And this is potentially the sort of way that you know, palm oil and other sorts of food crops could be uh, enhanced in their yield in a way to produce uh, more biofuels. But in the end, we're going to have to, with increasing populations, we're going to have to turn to other plants uh, to get uh, to, to a, a sensible biofuel feedstock. And so the plant that uh, me and my colleagues at Cosping Harbor, also at Brookhaven National Labs and at Stony Brook, have been, uh, have been uh, working on for the last few years are duckweeds. These are in the family Lemnaceae. These are small aquatic plants. Uh, they grow extremely fast. Uh, they have, uh, they're already in, in quite widespread use for basic research, but also for environmental monitoring because their growth rates are so high that it's easy to measure the effects of various chemicals. And for wastewater remediation, they're extremely efficient consumers of nitrogen and phosphorus, and so they're in quite widespread use in different parts of the world for municipal and agricultural wastewater remediation. Uh, as I said, they have this very high rate of biomass accumulation that make them a pretty attractive target uh, for, uh, for uh, biofuels. Uh, importantly, they don't compete uh, with food production. They can grow on wastewater. It does have to be fresh, though there are people working on that. Uh, but it can be very, very dirty. It can have lots of heavy me uh, metals and, and so on. Uh, they have almost no lignin because they don't have stems or branches or anything like that that needs lignin to support them. Uh, they can uh, produce for a very long time. Furthermore, they're already out there in the environment. They're all over the world. Common duckweed is found in Alaska as well as in Bangladesh. Uh, and they're cheap and easy to grow. Uh, this is just a sort of family portrait of the Lemnaceae. There are uh, four genera, actually five genera, uh, most of them are shown here. Uh, the very smallest flowering plants, Wolfia, uh, you can fit 5,000 of them in a thimble. Uh, so they really are tiny. Uh, but they double uh, every two days. Uh, and that, uh, of course, uh, clonally, uh, without sexual propagation. Now, having said that, they can produce seeds. Uh, they can produce pollen and flowers. Uh, it's quite difficult to get them to do this, uh, but that does mean that you can, in principle, do some forms of genetics. Uh, so uh, here's just a, a little bit of botany I was going to tell you. Um, so these are the, uh, the, this, these are the, the, the systematics of Lemnaceae. Uh, this is the smallest uh, known Lemnaceae, Wolfia micros microscopica, <laughs> sorry, in which you literally can put 5,000 of them in a thimble. And this is the basic uh, anatomy in which a single frond will, through a, a stem cell-like group of cells at one end, produce additional fronds that can then bud off and make their own stem cells. And they can do that every 48 hours under the right conditions. And this makes them almost scary to grow in the laboratory. Put a single frond in a flask, come back the next week, and there's no water left, and they're all over the place. Um, so uh, they, as I said, they don't flower very often, but we can persuade them to flower. Okay, there's a lot of variation, uh, natural variation, which we can exploit. Uh, they have this uh, growth rate variation, but also the starch content can get extremely high. The starch content is actually comparable with corn kernels. Uh, that's without the stems and the leaves and all the rest of the stuff that you have to take in corn as well. This is, this is a very high uh, starch content. Protein is actually also high. It's often used as an animal feed supplement and even for human food uh, in, in some parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, but its lipid content is relatively low, and so we've set out to try to make uh, 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 duckweed into a potential source of biodiesel. Uh, biodiesel uh, requires a high level uh, of saturated uh, fats, so it's actually the sort of uh, uh, relatively, relatively difficult to get in vegetables. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and so we've done a quick survey of the oils that are already found in duckweed. Uh, when we do that, uh, we find that indeed uh, Lemna gibber, uh, uh, which is one of the common duckweeds, uh, has a pretty high level of the uh, saturated fats that make uh, very good biodiesels and actually it's competitive with palm oil from that point of view. So that's good news. However, the amount of this type of fat that they produce is very low. Uh, but we think we can shift metabolism from starch into oil using various tricks uh, that have been used in other species. And, uh, and before I tell you about that, very importantly for this meeting, uh, the, uh, they've been used extensively for carbon fixation and photosynthetic rate analysis over, over decades of research, actually. Uh, and indeed, uh, they respond extremely well to very high concentrations of CO2. Even up to 5,000 parts per million, uh, duckweeds grow better the higher the carbon uh, that, you, that you give them. So they, they really have at, at, at even quite uh, low light intensities. So in fact, uh, uh, this is a very efficient photosynthetic system, carbon fixation system. Okay, how do we, uh, how do we uh, improve uh, duckweed? We have to first make the molecular tools that we need for genetic engineering. Uh, and we're busy doing that at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, one of the first things we've done uh, is to sequence the genome. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, but we've also started to develop tools that can manipulate genes in such a way to, for, for example, to commit carbon pathways from starch to oil instead. This is the genome uh, sequence. Uh, this is actually my colleague, Evan Ernst, who's in the audience, uh, uh, sequenced the genome, more or less on his own. Uh, this is the genome of Lemna Gibber, and this is the website he put together you can, you can go and have a look at. It's all publicly available. Anyone can use the data. They don't have to tell us. They just download it. Uh, and I should say that the Department of Energy, uh, through the Joint Genome Institute in Berkeley, has also sequenced another species called Spirodella polyrhiza, which was recently published as well. So we have all the genes in hand uh, to do the sort of things we want to do. Very importantly, oh, this is just an example of what that browser looks like. You can, for those of you who are geneticists, I know there's probably almost no one here, but you can, <laughs> you can, you can download all of this data. You can look at the gene structure. This is a very important gene uh, for oil biosynthesis, and, and it's all it's all there uh, in our in our genome, in our duckweed genome. So molecular tools in order to uh, uh, manipulate genes in the way that, that we want to. The first and most important thing to do is to make a transformation protocol. This is to say to be able to introduce DNA stably into these plants. That's quite difficult to do because of their clonal growth pattern. Uh, it had been done before, but at very, very low efficiencies. So one of the things we did in the lab was to try and improve that. And the reason for that is we want to, uh, both overexpress genes and underexpress genes to change the balance between starch and oil. And we've been uh, successful in being able to get transformation to work. Uh, in order to do this initially, we used a test gene that was very easy to see. This is actually the jellyfish uh, green fluorescent protein, which was developed here at Columbia by Roger Chen uh, many years ago. Uh, and that gives you a visual marker. And so, as you can see, after a few days uh, and weeks of, uh, of growth on selective media, we can obtain fully transformed uh, uh, callus, uh, these are cells, uh, from uh, duckweed, which will then regenerate into completely transformed fronds. And this sort of efficiency is comparable with some of our best model plants. So we're quite excited about this. This means we can really use very uh, high throughput, high tech uh, ways to manipulate uh, genes. And uh, we've uh, taken our inspiration from work that's been done uh, in other plants. This was actually done in the model plant Arabidopsis, but similar work has been done uh, in Australia recently in tobacco, where genes that are master regulators of the starch versus oil carbon allocation uh, have been manipulated in these plants, uh, and uh, they can greatly increase the levels of, of oil in Arabidopsis here up to tenfold. And recently in tobacco, the, uh, workers in Australia using a few additional steps have been able to get more than a hundred times the amount of oil that would normally be produced. And this is competitive with oil palm, for example. So it's really getting up there. So we think we can do this. We've made a start uh, by taking some genes, uh, fusing them uh, to, to GFP so that we can easily see uh, the transformation. So here is a light uh, micrograph of a duckweed frond, and you can see it's fully transformed uh, with our, our, our foreign DNA. Uh, and, and then uh, we've looked at oil levels in these plants, and again, we can, we can reproduce the results in other plants very well. Uh, if this looks like a smudge of oil uh, on a plate, that's exactly what it is. Uh, we can actually get uh, quite high levels of triacylglycerides uh, in these plants, and we think we can do even better using various, various other genes. Uh, the, uh, there is a downside, it's never easy. Um, the, these uh, plants uh, react to having uh, large amounts of oil in them, uh, just as algae do actually. So algae also uh, 
uh, slow down their growth when you, when you get them to produce oil. But we think we can get around that in this system by using inducible uh, genes, which we can turn on and off at will, uh, and, uh, and that's how we're hoping to get around uh, this, this problem. And, and, and we're, we're quite confident we can do that based on work in other plants. I just want to finish on uh, the sort of global history of duckweeds. Um, uh, we've, uh, you've probably seen a lot of this uh, data before, but I'd just like to remind you of it. In terms of air capture, duckweeds were probably the stars of the Eocene. Uh, in the Eocene 50 million years ago, uh, the uh, Arctic Ocean was actually landlocked, and so the, the first several meters was, was fresh water. And as a result, they grew a huge amount of duckweeds, in, in this case ferns, but, but aquatic plants exactly like duck, we call them duckweeds. Uh, and uh, Arctic sea temperatures were ridiculous. They were 13 degrees centigrade, uh, you know, which is amazing when you think about it. Uh, and it led to an enormous bloom of, of these duckweeds, which was detected by the Arctic Survey, which went out into the Arctic and drilled uh, uh, several, uh, uh, several kilometers, I think, into the, into the crust to, to record the history of plant life in the Arctic Ocean. And what they found was that there was a, a 20 meter thick layer of azola fossils. That is ridiculous, <laughs> uh, which means this place was really blooming uh, with duckweed. Uh, and according to calculations, uh, this may have drawn up to 80% of the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at the time. Now at the time, in, in, in the Eocene, the uh, carbon dioxide levels were extremely high. They were six times what they are now. Uh, and in, in less than a million years, through this, uh, this blooming process, uh, they were reduced to, to current levels. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to, uh, first of all, engineer the Arctic Ocean to be landlocked, and then <laughs> though, though that might happen, given what's happening now. <laughs> but, but with some help from our friends in chemical engineering and some, and some of our friends uh, working on carbon fixation, with elevated carbon levels in greenhouses and in, 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 in artificial uh, uh, reactors, essentially, we might be able to generate really high levels of, of air capture using these plants and hopefully turn it directly into, into usable fuels. Uh, just one last thing. Um, uh, my colleague Evan and I recently uh, applied for funding from, uh, ha having failed to receive funding on this planet, uh, we decided which, <laughs> <laughs> which is not quite fair. We did get money from the DOE to start this, but <laughs> we searched off-world and uh, <laughs> And we are hoping, uh, we've, we've applied, we were invited to apply, which is very nice, uh, that NASA, through their uh, program on the International Space Station, will let us grow duckweed in space. This is not the first time this has happened. In 1966, uh, a duckweed, Spiridella, uh, was grown successfully in an orbital vehicle, a free, a free flight uh, orbital vehicle, which was uh, shot up, and they were able to measure oxygen uh, evolution and, and carbon fixation in space, which at the time was a huge achievement. This is without uh, uh, the technology that we have now. But anyway, so we're hoping that once again we can use duckweed for very obvious applications in, uh, in space stations. So what have I told you? I think Lemnosia are perfect candidates for the biofuel. Uh, as, an oil site, as an oil source though, they need genetic modification. We're, we're well on the way to doing that uh, by developing these tools and we're testing various strategies for that. Finally, um, these are the people in my lab uh, who've contributed to this over the last three years. Uh, we were funded by the Department of Energy, along with Brookhaven National Labs, with John Shanklin there, and also some colleagues at Stony Brook, and we have other people, other people to thank. So I'll be happy to take some questions later. Thank you. Tim Kruger from Oxford. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you, Klaus, for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to run a, a brief video. Ooh, that's bad. Um, we're going to run a brief video, and then I'm going to give a, a presentation. But just before we start the video, um, I've been looking at what you can do with a 5% CO2. So using it in greenhouses is one thing. Um, I'm also working with Klaus on another idea, which is about uh, increasing weathering rates and storing CO2 as bicarbonate ions in the ocean. Um, but that's not the subject of this talk. Um, but if we can run this one, God, that's awful. Um, if we can run this one, then uh, you'll see how we can use CO2 to uh, decrease the amount of water that we need to grow. Hi, biomass. I'm Tim Kruger from the University of Oxford, and I'm here today to explain to you about an idea that we're developing that could radically change the way that we look at irrigation and dramatically reduce the amount of water that we need to produce biomass. So at the moment, we need about a thousand tons of water for every ton of crop that we produce. 
Most of that water is lost by evaporation and transpiration. Imagine that you've got a piece of land that you want to grow some crop on, but you haven't got much water. What you could do is you could put a greenhouse over that piece of land, and that would stop the water escaping. But you've got a problem. There's only a certain amount of carbon dioxide in that greenhouse, and as the plants grow, they use up that carbon dioxide. Once they've used up the carbon dioxide, then the plants will stop growing until you refresh the air in the greenhouse. Now, at the moment, we've got slightly less than 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. And while that's a big problem in terms of climate change and the health of the oceans, it's actually a small amount for plants to use. In fact, 400 parts per million is about one part in every two and a half thousand. And what that means is that in order to get a volume of carbon dioxide into the greenhouse, you need to exchange two and a half thousand volumes of air. You put the fresh air in to introduce the carbon dioxide, but you're going to have to vent out old air. And when you do that, you take moisture with you. So that doesn't work. You're back to square one. What we've got in mind is a different system. What you have is a sealed box, clear to let the light in, and you fill that box with water. In that water, you have algae growing. Now, because it's sealed, you don't lose any moisture by evaporation. And into this box, you pump pure carbon dioxide. Now, you're still going to need to vent the system because when the carbon dioxide is consumed by photosynthesis, it generates oxygen. So you're going to need to vent off that oxygen to prevent a buildup of pressure. But now it's in a ratio of one to one, as opposed to two and a half thousand to one. So you will lose a small amount of moisture in the air that you vent from the system, but a huge amount less than you did previously. Paradoxically, we're irrigating deserts with the wrong stuff. We give water to plants, which then give it away in order to obtain an even scarcer commodity that they require for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide. If you give them carbon dioxide, they don't need to give away nearly as much water. At the moment, we need about 1,000 tons of water for every ton of crop that we produce. Using this system, you need a ratio of just one to one. One ton of water for one ton of crop. That's the theory. Now let's have a look at the practice. So what we have in here is the experiment to test the theory. We have two chambers. One contains an algae, chlorella, and the other a floating macrophyte, duckweed fern, lemna. So what we have is a tube running into the system, and that introduces carbon dioxide at the rate of about a milliliter per minute. It then bubbles around this system. There's a pump at the bottom that aerates this, this chamber. And then it flows out through this tube here. And when it flows out through this tube, it goes through this desiccant here that removes any moisture in the air coming out. By doing that, we can measure how much moisture is lost from the system. And that's the only way that water can be lost from the system. We can also measure the amount of biomass that's produced. And dividing the amount of water being lost by the amount of biomass produced tells us what this water use efficiency is. Typical agriculture is about 1,000 to 1. The theory says this should be about 1 to 1, and that's what these experiments are showing. The same thing is being done with the lemna, again with similar results, one-to-one -one ratio. This research is focused on organisms that grow in water, but there's no reason why it shouldn't also work on plants that grow in soil. That is what we want to explore in further research. We've shown that it works at benchtop scale. What we need to do is to understand whether this can work at a much larger scale. If it does work, and we need to be cautious about this because these are only preliminary results, but if it does work, it has profound implications. It could dramatically reduce the amount of water that is required to produce crops. It would allow us to use land that we currently consider too arid, and it would also address issues about salinification and eutrophication. So, this is just the start. We want to go further with this research, and hopefully, with your help, we can. Okay. So that work was done about uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and since then, we uh, managed to get some more funding. We, we got a, an award in the UK called the Greenius Award, which was looking at 
food, water, energy nexus, and that allowed us to do uh, a bit more research from there. Um, so obviously those experiments were extremely small scale. Um, they were also in a, a temperature controlled light box. Um, and so we wanted to do some more experiments from that. Um, and also we used pure CO2 in that case. Um, what we've been looking at in the subsequent experiments is using a 10% CO2, and there's no reason why it shouldn't work for 5% CO2 as well. If you think about it, we talked about a one-to-one -one ratio uh, of uh, gas coming out for gas coming in if you use pure CO2. That's not to say you get the level of CO2 in the, the container up to 100%. It just means that you top up at, uh, uh, what you top up the CO2 is at 100%, but the amount that you uh, have in there might be held stable at, uh, say, to 3,000 parts per million. Um, if you go to 5%, then you have a, a 20 to 1 ratio. So you are letting more air through the system. You are losing more moisture than if you used a 100% a, a, a CO2. But still, 20 volumes of air for each volume of CO2 you're adding is still a lot better than the 2,500 to 1 that you had. So these are the results from the initial experiment, the experiments that you saw. Um, and what we had was the chlorella, uh, was, the alga, was uh, less than one to one uh, the amount of uh, CO2, uh, sorry, the, the amount of water that was lost from the system, and, and same with the, the lemna, so about 0.7. Very small uh, experiments, uh, probably, you know, I'm presenting it, but it's probably uh, not at, of a quality that would be publishable, to be frank, uh, with these experiments. Uh, but they were indicative and they gave us the impetus to go further. The limitations of the experiment were that it's very small scale, it only looked at aquatic species and it was temperature controlled, which is obviously not a realistic scenario. So what we wanted to do, uh, we, we did some experiments at Plant Sciences at Oxford and we used larger seal tanks. Uh, we used both uh, terrestrial and aquatic species and uh, we had a, a regime where the uh, temperature of the greenhouses was able to be controlled. We raised it up to 40 degrees centigrade during the day and down to 10 degrees at night. And what that allowed us to do was to mimic what might go on in a desert environment. So we identified three challenges at the outset. One was about temperature control, one was about humidity control, and the third was around cost. And all three of these need to be addressed if it's going to actually be viable. So uh, this is a, a view of uh, how the uh, experiment looked initially. Uh, we had a greenhouse. Uh, we had these big fish tanks, about a meter long, 40 by 40 centimeters. And the, the first experiments we did uh, were abiotic, so just water in, the, uh, in these fish tanks. Uh, they were sealed. And uh, we raised the temperature uh, up to 40 degrees during the day and down to 10 degrees um, at night and uh, we put different levels of water in these tanks and the idea here was that the more water you have in the tank the less movement you get in the temperature over the course of the day so the water in the tank acts as a thermal buffer so if you think of the diurnal swing in temperature from 40 down to 10 it's very rapid but by having uh, the the water in there you stabilize the temperature so the the temperature of the peak of the day is too hot and the end of the day uh, in, in the night is too cold but by having a body of water in there you create this thermal inertia you stabilize the temperature and this is what we showed so uh, instead of uh, ranging between 10 and 40 if you put 20 centimeters of water in this, these tanks it went between about um, 18 degrees and 28 degrees um, then uh, we, we did some experiments this is with, with lemna and uh, what we did here was uh, we were looking at uh, how they responded to humidity. Because these tanks were sealed, you got very high humidity. Um, it obviously isn't ideal conditions, uh, but it is something that they were able to cope with. So it was possible to get these organisms, uh, certainly the floating macrophytes, that's organisms that grow in water, uh, even if they get their CO2 from the air. Obviously, if you're working with algae, it doesn't matter about the humidity in the air above the water because they're, they're not interacting with that. But with organisms like this, they are. Um, and then uh, we wanted to have a look at experiments looking at terrestrial species. 
Um, first of all, um, th these are uh, cabbages um, that are in seeding pots, which are made of polystyrene, which we floated in the tanks. And I would have obviously failed horticulture 101 because we put them in, uh, in the uh, containers at too high a temperature. And what you see with this white here is that they were, they were shocked. They were shocked by the change in temperature. So they've been uh, uh, used to temperatures of about 10 degrees centigrade, and we put them in here at temperatures of about 25 degrees centigrade, and they, they blanched, they turned white. But they did recover from that, and so this is a couple of weeks later, uh, they did recover from that. Uh, when we repeated the experiments uh, with, uh, these are some uh, chili plants that we, uh, we uh, got them up to the right temperature before we put them in the system, and they did very well, and, and in fact they, they budded and flat. We didn't have enough time to go through an entire life cycle um, in the experiments that we had, uh, but we had some positive results from what, what we could see. Um, we also managed to show that we had this uh, very dramatic reduction in the amount of water that was required. Uh, so this is replicating really the experiments we did in the, the first set of experiments. Um, and uh, what we did is we, we did a 10% CO2 for both chlorella, which is the algae, and uh, another algae, um, Botryococcus brownii, which is very important in producing oils for, for fuels. Um, a, a lot of work's been done on that as a reference species. And we pumped through 10% uh, CO2 and we pumped through ambient air as a control. Both of them, both of the systems had low water usage, uh, which was interesting. Uh, obviously, with more CO2, you get this CO2 fertilization effect. The more CO2 you introduce, the faster it grows. And it was about four times faster, uh, the accumulation of biomass uh, with the high CO2 concentration. And uh, yeah, this is again showing the CO2 fertilization effect. This, this graph here is uh, in the middle is a uh, log graph. So although those two things, those, that blue and red line don't look very far apart, they are actually quite far apart. Again, it's, it's about four times the amount of biomass that is produced at the, at the higher CO2 concentrations. And down in the, the bottom left here, you've got um, the Botryococcus, um, and it, it it accumulates mainly at the bottom of the, the flask, you can see. But there, there's a lot more of it, and the, the figures are about four times as much um, uh, that you can uh, get out of uh, a run. Um, so the implications of this, um, the irrigation con CO2 irrigation concept is con confirmed a very low water loss. Uh, we can definitely grow algae in this system, um, and uh, the humidity levels are still problematic for terrestrial species. So that would need to be addressed. Um, and also the body of water acted as a thermal buffer. So you might think, well, if you want to stabilize the temperature in a, a, of a growing environment in a desert, you have this large body of water. Well, if it's open to the air, that water is all going to evaporate. The whole point of this system is it's sealed, and therefore it doesn't evaporate. And so you, can, you only have to take the water once to the desert, and then it stays there in that sealed box. But it acts as a thermal buffer. And then finally, this is a picture of Africa, obviously, and the bit at the top is yellow. Um, why is it yellow? Because of a lack of water. No, it's yellow because of a lack of carbon dioxide. So if you were able to supply carbon dioxide, and if Klaus can give me CO2 at 5% concentration, um, that's ample. Um, if we talk about a good yield um, in this country, it's about 10 tonnes a hectare, two and a half tons an acre uh, of crop. Um, 10 tons a hectare, uh, if you're on a one-to-one -one ratio of water to biomass, requires 10 tons of water. And let's say we need 10 times as much of that, that waste in the system. So you need 100 tons of water per hectare per year uh, to grow a decent crop in, in the Sahara Desert. Well. That sounds like a lot of water until you realize that 100 tons of water, so a single millimeter of rain over a hectare is 10 tons of water. So what you need is 10 millimeters of rain in order to supply enough water to grow that crop. Now, even in the driest parts of the Sahara, you get 40 millimeters of rainfall a year on average. Yeah? So 
The problem there is not a lack of water. The problem is a lack of carbon dioxide. That's not an invitation to put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. <laughs> um, but that is saying that that land which is currently non-photosynthetically active because of the lack of water, or rather the lack of carbon dioxide, could be. So this is a way in which we can actually increase the photosynthetic capacity of the planet. Thank you very much. Dr. Gupta from Research Triangle. Thank you, Klaus, for the opportunity to speak and talk about the work we are doing at RTI. We believe the sustainable biofuels is a small step towards carbon management. It's not going to solve the issue with the, with the, with the CO2 uh, you know, going into the atmosphere, but at least it's the right step in the right direction. You know. so I want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, David Dayton, who manages the biofuels program at RTI. And he spent uh, quality of, uh, quite, a, quite a bit of time at uh, NREL where he was the team leader at uh, doing the biofuels technology. So you know, who, people who don't know RTI, uh, we are uh, located in North Carolina. We are uh, second largest uh, not-for-profit research institution, about 3,700 staff. Uh, and our research budget uh, last year was uh, in around $750 million. So the energy technology program which I manage at RTI has uh, five uh, domains, uh, syngas, which is our traditional clean coal area. Then the natural gas is mainly from the shell gas, uh, which, uh, uh, which is developing pretty rapidly. Carbon captures, uh, which uh, I'll briefly touch upon. Then industrial water, how do we really manage water for these energy systems, uh, energy water nexus, and the biofuels, which I will talk about that. And most of the work in our group is the applied work. We don't really do that much fundamental work. So you'll see pictures of big systems uh, we design and build to take that technology to the next level. So you know, you've seen this uh, photo all, all day that photosynthesis uh, you know, basically allows us to grow the biomass. Uh, you know, it's, a small, it's, it's a slow process uh, of getting CO2 plus sunlight plus water going into the, into the plant and creating biomass, uh, it's, a, it's a long process, although there are some genetic engineering uh, which you can do to grow them rapidly, but, uh, but uh, here is basically the cycles, uh, you know, you can do that, and also biomass, you can use it uh, to produce oil, or hydrogen, or methane, or electricity, you heard uh, a lot this morning, and a uh, whole day. So, so if, you, if you look at the, the challenge of the transportation fuel in the U.S., we use roughly, you know, this is a bit outdated slide, but still the numbers have not changed drastically. So roughly 19 and a half million barrels per day of the oil we use uh, per day. 71% of that goes for transportation. So out of this oil, we have 140 billion gallons of gasoline, uh, 43 billion gasoline of diesel, and 25 billion gallons of aviation fuel. So, you know, to assume that biofuels will replace all these fuel is probably not the not realistic. So, so you know, but biofuels could definitely uh, make uh, make a difference. You know, in uh, uh, so the EPA now is uh, mandating that 36 billion uh, gallons of gasoline by 2022, which, uh, mean, which out of which 21 billion gallons must be cellulosic, uh, because they are basically slowly phasing out the corn uh, uh, corn ethanol, and and uh, last few years. Uh, we have been not able to meet the, this quota. So EPA has been constantly revising these numbers because there are no real commercial plants uh, uh, which, uh, which, are, which are capable of producing the cellulosic biofuels. And I'll talk about it, why that's the issue is. And the definition of biofuels is that they must deliver at least 20% life cycle greenhouse gas reduction. There is a methodology by which you do this accounting and the life, uh, life cycle gas in green, you know, life cycle greenhouse gas m must be reduced by that. So, so this is a huge problem, and I think biofuels can definitely play a role, provided that they can be produced economically. Because right now, most of the biofuels require either tax incentive or subsidies or some type of tax credits, and that's not a sustainable where you can get significant amount of investment. 
So, so I'll, I'll call this the biomass to biofuels is a com complex supply chain. You know, you know, if you look at a supply chain, typically, this is a very, very complex chain. The reason it's a complex supply chain is if you want to build a big biofuels production facility, say 2,000 tons per day, which is typically we build coal gasification plants, two to 5,000 tons per day, 10,000 per day, you cannot logistically collect 2,000 tons per day of biomass in a 50 mile radius. So, so then how do you really put all the, all the support structure for handling feed, the, 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 the processing the feed, getting ready to feed it? So that becomes a fairly complex supply chain. So, so you know, what residue you get, you know, every time you get a different crop, do you adjust your process? So, so it's a pretty complex uh, chain where from feedstock supply to the feedstock logistics, uh, to the biofuels distribution, to the biofuels utilization, how do you do the engineering? How do, you, how do you really deal with the economies? And how do you manage the risk? Suppose some crop does not grow, or there's some problem here. So that's one of the reasons where you really don't get a huge amount of investment from the, from the industry to set up these large biofuels plant. But things which makes perfect sense is can you really do these things in a distributed, distributed manner? So and I'll talk about that briefly, how do you really do these things in a, in a distributed manner where you can really make a difference doing that. And then other considerations with biofuels is the sustainability, the water, we just heard the, 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 the talk about what it, how much water it takes to grow. The greenhouse gas emission, which we heard on the previous thing is that sometimes, uh, you know, from uh, corn ethanol, greenhouse gas may be negative rather than positive, then the policy regulatory mandates and the financial market. So, so these, this is a very complex process in terms of making a commercial venture out of making biofuels. So, so if you look at the, the biofuel processes, there are a number of ways you can, you can make biofuels. Uh, and this is basically a high level uh, flow sheet. Uh, you could take cellulosic feedstock from agri ag residues to forest resources, energy crops, and even municipal solid waste also could be used as a, as a biomass and a lot of companies are looking into that. So essentially you take a feedstock, you have cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin, you have to deconstruct it, make, a, make, a, uh, make some type of intermediate and then upgrade to make a product. But if you look at the biochemi biochemical route, you pretty much go to the sugars and you make for, you do fermentation or by catalysis and make bioproducts. Sugars to oil has been a challenge. People can make ethanol, I think that's probably okay, but making sugars directly to the, to the gasoline or diesel, a lot of people have tried, has really not worked out economically. Then a traditional way is you can take biomass gasified, make syngas, you can either ferment it to make ethanol, or you can run catalysis to make various fuels. This is a very well known process. The problem with the gasification is the economies of scale. Can you really build a large gasification plant for biomass? Then the, another way, which is probably more and more getting traction is the pyrolysis or direct liquefaction. Basically, you heat the biomass in the absence of oxygen and make a bio oil. And then using catalysis, which we are doing, and I'll talk about that, that you can make gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. And then the RG, we heard it, you can do in the open pond, or you can do a closed bioreactor with, the, with genetically you know, engineered RG and you can do trans transesterification or some catalysis to make the fuels here. So this is basically the various pathways by which you can produce biofuels, and some of them make sense uh, to make bioproducts, for example, like nutraceuticals or some, uh, some niche products, and, uh, and uh, for making the fuels, either gasification or the paralysis are the commercial processes which one can use. So, so if you look at the biochemical conversion route, uh, you know, from that you basically take the feedstocks, go to the pre-treatment or deconstruction. Typically you do hydrolysis, which could be enzymatic or catalytic. Essentially you make sugars or some type of intermediate to, and drop out the lignin. And lignin basically you, you use it for making heat and power. And then take the sugars to do the C6 to C5 fermentation, make a huge amount of CO2. It's a good quality CO2. And you do the product recovery and make ethanol and butanol. And a number of companies who are basically doing that. And I think the butanol is getting pretty popular because it's a, it has higher BTU density. But on the, on the gasification side, uh, you know, which, uh, which uh, you know, there are a number of projects which are happening. Uh, feed processing and handling is one of the most difficult challenge in the biofuels change because biomass has a very low energy density. You can buy coal for 13,000 BTU per pound, 
typical biomass, which is wet, maybe 5,000, 5,000, 6,000 pounds VTU per pound. You have to dry it, you have to crush it, you have to grind it, you feed it, and feeding biomass in a pressurized gasifier is no trivial thing. Then you, you, you make uh, uh, syngas, which needs to be clean, cleaned up. You heard from the other top, so this morning that tar cleanup and other things is requires a major undertaking. You have to clean, condition the syngas by either shifting the hydrogen to CO ratio, then go to the fuel synthesis, and then make advanced biofuels. And you know, and there are processes uh, where you can you can do that, but the, it's not very cost effective because by the time you do all these things, and if you want to do a small scale, it doesn't pay off to recover the capital. So, and then the syngas you make, you know, then you can do a lot of things with that syngas. You can basically make hydrogen, you can make methane, you can make methanol, you can make DME, you can make and DME could go into the gasoline or diesel pool. You can do mixed alcohol synthesis to make even ethanol or FT. So, but the key thing is, is how cheap can you get the syngas from the biomass? That basically, basically becomes, the, becomes the critical question. But the route which uh, we, we basically, after uh, you know, evaluating all the options, we believe that the pyrolysis, where basically you take the biomass and heat it in the absence of oxygen, and essentially you do what we call direct liquefaction, you can make uh, pyrolysis vapor, and if you condense the vapors out, you can basically collect bio oil, and that bio oil essentially acts like a crude oil, which you can, uh, you can use it. One of the, you can use in a, in a typical refinery. The only problem is biomass contains roughly 40% oxygen, and if you just do it by doing that, you will also get an oil which has 40% oxygen, and the amount of hydrogen you will need to make anything useful out of that biomass is going to be tremendous. It's never going to be very cost effective or economic for you to use this route directly. So what we have been doing is we're basically looking into, looking into some way to, to use a catalyst to basically get rid of this oxygen. So there are a couple of ways you could do it. You can do in situ catalysis or you can do ex situ catalysis. In situ means within the pyrolysis reactor, you put a catalyst and you, you basically, when biomass is, is pyrolyzed, the, 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 during the deconstruction process, you rearrange the chemistry so essentially you get an oil which is very low in oxygen and that, that can be treated easily. That's, we, we're doing a huge amount of work at RTI. Or in the XC2, you make the vapors and then process the vapor over a catalyst and then make oil, oil which is low in uh, uh, oxygen and then the, do the hydro treating. But our goal is to make a oil, make a final product which is less than $3 per gallon. And that's the goal which Department of Energy has. Uh, and they're funding a number of uh, a number of projects. So the beauty about this, this concept is that you don't need a 2,000 ton per day system. You can have a 50 ton system, essentially make the oil, and ship the oil to the refinery. So you really don't need to do the processing at one place. So based on this technology, uh, we basically, uh, basically developed a catalytic pyrolysis process at R RTI, where we are re rejecting oxygen within the pyrolysis reactor making an oil which can be hydro-processed. And, uh, and so, you know, some of the things we still have, are working is, is how do we balance the hydrogen need, how do we minimize the carbon rejection, and how do we maximize the oxygen, uh, oxygen removal from the system. So you see this system, uh, we basically have designed and built a system. Uh, at RTI, it's a roughly one ton per day a biomass unit, which, uh, which uh, we can make uh, roughly two barrels per day of oil in this. And we, from this oil, we have basically shown that you can upgrade this oil to, to, a, to a traditional uh, gasoline diesel fraction uh, type oil, you know. So as so you can see, it's a very clean, you can see the picture here, and it can be done with a conventional refinery product. So, so the idea here is basically make this oil and, and supply to a refiner, which they can use the uh, existing assets to process it, so you don't have to put a new refinery just to process this oil. So in, in case of the algae, we, we are involved in a project, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because we, we, we have a pro project where we're producing large amount of CO2, and we're talking to a company who wants to basically buy that CO2 from us to, to produce algae, which produces ethanol. But in an algae growth, there are a couple of ways you can do. It is you can, you can do concentration and dewatering, and do the oil extraction or hydro treating. But the project which we are working at algae is that algae itself produces ethanol as it absorbs the CO2. So that means you, you, that's the primary product and it's produced continuously. 
So one of the things we are doing is we're doing a fair amount of life cycle assessment to understand, you know, what these uh, these uh, these technologies are doing. You know, is what is the you know uh, what is the techno economic potential. You know, we are also looking at the GIS based assessment of optimal feedstock resource potential. What are the land use issues? And and the most important is well well to wheel analysis and expansion of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and. Uh, energy use in transportation using the GREET model. If some of you are familiar with that, and basically looking at the whole bio, biofuels uh, life cycle issues, you know. Hmm. So, so one of the, the charts which uh, has been produced by Department of Energy is, if you look at the carbon emissions from various transportation fuels, the coal to liquid, CTL, where you basically you gasify the coal, uh, run the fissure tropes, and you see that's probably the most carbon intensive. Roughly, you can see 20,000 grams of CO2 equivalent per gallon of gasoline. If you do with the crude oil and gasoline, it's about half of that. You do corn ethanol, I think it's another 20% cheap, 20% lower than the gasoline. Cellulosic ethanol is a bit negative, but one of the things which, uh, which DOE is really interested in is biomass to liquids. If you take biomass and make fuels from that, it could be a negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions and can give us, uh, give us some credits for that, you know. From the pyrolysis process, which we are working on it, uh, we can basically see that uh, if you do it right and uh, you can do some integration of the hydrogen production within it, you can get significant amount of uh, life cycle uh, greenhouse gas reductions uh, in, the, in the process, you know. So, uh, so in addition to biofuels, we have a large activity in the carbon capture uh, at RTI, so I'm quite familiar with some of these issues. We're looking into post-combustion CO2 capture from uh, coal powered plants, cement, power, cement, cement, uh, uh, cement plants, as well as the pre-combustion on the gasification. And a lot of work is in various stages of development from small lab scale to essentially a demo scale model. So one of, uh, we are looking into a number of technologies from uh, non-echo solvents to the solid solvents to polymeric membranes, also removing CO2 at high temperatures using the syngas and, and with a number of technologies. One of the projects which uh, we, and I'll talk tomorrow about it, that where we really build a big plant of removing CO2 at Tampa Electric Facility in Florida, where we, we're taking a 50 megawatt slipstream of the gas and capturing 300,000 tons of CO2 per year. In this plant, uh, the plan, plan was to basically store that CO2 underground at the site, but uh, again, given some of these issues with the, with the regulatory and the risk issues, we were not able to, to, to do that but we have learned a lot in terms of what it will take to, to some of these things to go forward in future. But, the, but the, in the end, you know, you can, you can do all these things, but, uh, but, uh, but unless uh, there is a clear price on carbon and there is a driver for people to do it, nobody is going to do it in industry because electricity is a cheap product. And most of the utility commissions, uh, they worry about the price of the electricity. So carbon essentially removal will double the prices. There has to be some other driver for people to do that. So just uh, to give you some, some of the newer research which we are doing at RTI, uh, basically we are trying to see if CO2 could play a react reaction role in the biomass conversion. So one of the things we did is a study. We looked at the various charts which are produced from petroleum coal to bituminous coal to the sub-bituminous coal to various biomass charts. And basically try to react the CO2 plus char to make carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide is the building block for a lot of chemical processes, including methanol. So one thing which is very interesting, we found the relative activity of the biomass charge is, charge is significantly higher than the activity of the charge made from the coal or petroleum coke. It could be as high as 20 times more for some of the switchgrass charge which we made. So that means it's feasible that you can take that char you can react the char with CO, uh, char with CO2, and make carbon monoxide, which could be a building block to make fuels or chemicals. And then you can further enhance this reactivity by adding certain catalysts, and you can go. So this this process is almost looking very commercial. That uh, you you may be able to to take this uh, char from biomass and CO2, react it, and then delay the the CO2 emissions. You know, in fact, you can consume some of the CO2. So, so this is some of the new work we just started uh, at RTI, and we are looking at to see how we can really build upon this, this discovery here. So in the end of the day, you know, we have to look at the sustainability, from feedstocks to the conversion technology to product distribution to product end use, and all the issues which are there. Technology, we believe, is a small component, but there are all the issues in terms of the policies and everything. So, all right.
Thank you very much. This is the team here. How long do we have for questions? <laughs> 10, minutes. 10 minutes. So we have 10 minutes left. Yes, sir. I'm Alex Orlov uh, from uh, uh, Stonybrook University. So it's uh, your neighbor. Fantastic presentation. So a comment and a uh, quick question. So the comment about biochar or char is interesting because uh, the char itself contains metals and you can actually sometimes you can put the plant in a particular area and extract metals from the ground and uh, we also work with the department of agriculture because by itself has certain agricultural benefits you can put it in soil and it's a storage of carbon so uh, i think it's a fascinating area uh, to continue uh, the question i have to to peter when when you talk about the plants uh, and aquatic plants the interesting question when you buy engineer them and again it's fascinating work uh, it looks like you, they're not growing as fast as the original one. And so the question is, from one point of view, it's good because they're not as invasive as the uh, plant you started with. But from another point of view, if you have a mixed batch, you have a contamination one batch with another, I think the original one probably would overtake the one you modified. Is it the correct statement? Yeah, one of the problems with both algae and, and other aquatic plants is that they don't like to grow under conditions where they produce the most oil. But we think we might be able to change that by having two different growth conditions. So for example, if you starve them for nitrogen, they produce more oil. That's actually how algae are coaxed into producing oil in the first place. So if you grew them on wastewater first, where they're in perfect scenarios where everything should grow the same, and then shift them over to well water after that, and some experiments like this were done actually some years ago, um, you might be able to induce the oil without more further growth. And that's sort of how we're thinking. And I can imagine a scenario using one of these carbon dioxide irrigation tanks as that final stage, if not earlier, uh, that, would really, that would really do it. There are other ways we can control growth rate. And we, we just had a quick comment about that. <laughs> um, we know a lot about how plants grow. And uh, into, you know, some of the sort of network theory about the integration of growth and metabolism um, are, are things that we can seriously address now that we can modify the plants. So it, it's, it's absolutely the key question, but we think we can do it. Okay. Thank you. If I can just briefly write, write to the same. Should you two work together in a way? Because <laughs> oh, yes. it <laughs> seems to me you have very little lignin. Uh, you have therefore very soft material, and shouldn't you really maximize for growth and then let the chemist do the chemistry? Mm. No, it's a perfect scenario. Yeah. I have a comment slash uh, question to uh, Tim. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, the fact, as I see, your, your presentation is that um, these excellent results from the lab, when you have to transfer them to Sahara, it's in huge hermetic sealed greenhouses, where you'll have a temperature about maybe 35 degrees C, I don't know, uh, totally uh, saturated with humidity, and 5% CO2. So my question is, which kind of creatures do you want to work in your greenhouses? What kind of what, sorry? Which kind of creatures are you supposed to work oh, yeah. in your, having working in your greenhouses? Hopefully not humans. Yeah. Um, so you're misinterpreting the 5% CO2 within the greenhouse. You restock with 5% CO2, but you don't... Um, so say, say, you, um, say this was the, the greenhouse in here and you've got plants growing instead of people and as the plants grow they take the CO2 out and they would reduce the level of CO2 maybe to 200 parts per million or lower than that but you want to maintain it at 2,000 parts per million what you could have is a bottle of CO2 of pure CO2 and release just a small amount of that pure CO2 so that you maintain the level of CO2 in the greenhouse at 2,000 parts per million. You've got pure CO2 there, but just because you're using pure CO2 doesn't mean that the level within the greenhouse is pure. So you use 5% CO2, but you don't raise the level of CO2 in the greenhouses to um, 5%. It, it, 
No, 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 but I'm not envisaging it as a, a place where um, people would work. If you're going to be producing Lemna or a Zola or something like that, then this is something you could probably automate. Um, you're not going to have people picking the Lemna. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. You're not going to have people picking. In, in fact, what we wanted to do, we, didn't, we ran out of time, but what we wanted to do was we wanted to actually have uh, lilos, you know, clear plastic um, lilos, and, and put the, the, the algae or the Lemna in there. Uh, an experiment with that. Um, that. That's really all you need. Yeah, so the camera uh, for Robert. Uh, you mentioned that, that the palm oil genome is sequenced and the gene for yield has in, uh, improved 30% yield. Then you mentioned the duckweed genome sequencing, etc. Uh, are it, it, we, we know the high throughput screening is becoming really cheap. Associated data analytics is getting really good. What stage are we right now? Uh, in the whole, you know, so that means that uh, th there seems to be a very great potential. I mean, are these early days still that there's a lot of potential for GM modified, uh, what GM modified, that's like LCD displays, for genetically modified uh, crops uh, and seeds? Are these early days or are we medium days? Uh, no, definitely medium. I mean, I, the technology that allowed us to do what happened with the oil palm genome is, is very new. So we started in 2009, eight or nine and found the gene a couple of years ago. And in that time, you know, we, we had the fantastic resources of the Malaysian geneticists, who were breeders, who'd been working for the last five, six decades to get the genetic resources together. But we were able to apply, you know, modern sequencing technology and some computing to find that gene. Yeah, but then and one of the interesting, you said 30% yield. What about, could you find a gene that goes to the phenotype of growth rate? I think, I think it's totally doable. I, it, I mean, we're doing it right now in May. It's so 20 so years, if we could do it in three years. So finding finding the gene could be a matter of a few years. And I mean, corn breeders, for example, you know, seed companies like Pioneer or Monsanto are doing this every day in corn. They're, they're using exactly that sort of technology to find genes that grow, that allow the corn to grow much faster. And you know, especially with a plant like Lemna, where we don't know anything right now, you know, that low-lying fruit, if you excuse the pun with respect to oil palm, is actually, you know, there to be picked. So I, I think we can do it quickly. We exhausted the audience. <laughs> I did that to you. Uh, so, kind of the rule of thumb is usually that uh, biomass gives you a power density of about half a watt per meter squared. So, I'm just curious about what these sorts of very advanced uh, biofuels give you, because if you think about it in terms of what we talked about in the morning, synthesizing fuels from, say, solar, that gives you something in the order of 10 watts per meter squared, something like that. So, you're still, like, many factors away. So, I'm just curious about what it looks like. Yeah, these are very important questions, and, and, and we need to team up with people like Tim here to, to really uh, get a handle on what the energy balance is for duckweed. We know the growth rate and the starch content uh, is, is extremely high. We don't know the answer to questions like that, and, and we, need, we, need to get those, we need to get those answers. And, and it largely depends how you grow them, obviously. So we know in wastewater scenarios, they can be very, very good. Um, in scenarios like Sahara Desert in a, in a box with, with carbon, we, we, uh, I have a feeling it's going to be good, but we, we need to measure it, yeah. So, so you, how much biomass do you make so the, per square meter per some time? So the calculation, actually, Evan's sitting behind you, it's, it's, what was it, 64 grams per day per meter squared or something like that. 64 grams, that's dry mass? Dry mass. Mm -hmm. At 400? At 400. And that, that clocks in at something like, I don't know, 10 times corn or maybe more. Yeah. Those are under ideal conditions. So, so can I just add, and it's a very good question, and I think um, as well as the, the energy efficiency that comes into it is the, the cost. Because uh, when you've got conventional agriculture, you have a, a, the land is a non-depreciating asset, and that's really important. Uh, when you have a sealed system, that sealed system is going to depreciate, it's going to wear out, and that creates a high capital cost. So you're going to need to factor that in to working out whether a fuel that you can produce from Lemna is actually going to be economically viable. 
Um, when you talk of solar cells, 10%, again, that solar cell has a, a, a cost, uh, a, a depreciation cost, a capital cost that you need to consider as well. So uh, it's really important that you do those calculations uh, to work it out um, for, uh, for solar cells and for systems that, that use biology uh, to generate fuels, sunlight.